have you ever heard this voice that might, in, might be in your head that tells you you might not be good enough? You know, it's the same voice that tells you you're either too short, too tall, too weak, too, um, you know, stupid, let's say, really too unworthy of achieving the things that you're most excited about, your greatest potential, and keeping you from pursuing things that you're most excited. Well, let me tell you, I also have that voice. And I've remembered having that voice as early, very, very early on. Um, this is actually a photo of me with a bunch of friends at my birthday party. And if you're wondering which little girl is me in the photo, I'm actually the elven looking girl that's holding the spirograph. How many of you actually know what a spirograph is? Okay, I hear they're coming back in fashion. Um, you know, spirographs are a toy that has all these different plastic pieces with gears essentially, and you add, let's say, a pen to it, and you can draw these beautiful geometric shapes. And so I absolutely loved having this spirograph. And I remember this little voice in my head would tell me, why is that something you're interested in? You know, girls are supposed to like dolls. Why are they liking these geometric shapes or science? And I remember very early on, I would just ignore that voice. And um, as I grew older, I wound up not only increasing my love for science, I also kind of pursued this passion of figure skating. And I actually started figure skating at five years old in Portland, Oregon. And what started out as you know, single skating wound up being ice dancing with a partner. And this is a photo of me and my partner. And if you think we look very alike, it's because we do. Um, this is my, my partner was actually my little brother. How many of you have siblings? How many of you would even consider dancing with your brother? <laughs> and we did that for several years. Uh, we worked together towards the same goal of eventually trying to compete uh, at the Olympics. And I can't believe that that's something I used to do, um, especially with my little brother. <laughs> but um, at the age of 14, literally the day after I was 14, I went out and got a job at the ice rink uh, to try and help pay for this really expensive activity for my brother and I. And that job involved, you know, cleaning public toilets and handing out rental skates. And thinking back to what I used to do, I just can't believe how gross that job was. But at the time, I loved it. it to me, it was an opportunity for me to be contributing to this long-term goal of someday going to the Olympics. And then in high school, we moved to Seattle, Washington to further our training. And as a junior in high school, my brother and I competed at the US Nationals, and we wound up winning on our age division. And as US champions, we were then invited to be members of the US International Figure Skating Team, where we wound up traveling the world, representing the United States at competition. And while we were pursuing this goal, this you know, long-term dream of going to the Olympics, I then enrolled uh, at University of Washington. I literally applied to only one school because it happened to be nearby the training center. And what I soon learned was how you know, my love for science and math really carried me through school while I still pursued this dream of the Olympics. Um, and so, uh, what, finally, you know, two years into college, we had this opportunity to compete at the U.S. Nationals and essentially go for the Olympic trials. And unfortunately, that same year, I had my very first serious injury. Uh, I wound up dislocating my shoulder and would do it over and over and over again, which made it really hard to train uh, that year. But, you know, as far as we were concerned, here's our one opportunity to, you know, try out for the Olympic team, and so we should just keep going and try. And U.S. Nationals was held in a huge arena with more than 10,000 people in attendance, and then you have a panel of judges that you're trying to impress where they're basically scrutinizing your every move looking for a single mistake. And um, you can imagine, you know, that 
moment, right? Years of work has culminated into this one opportunity to compete and try to go to the Olympics. And I was obviously nervous, right? And I had this feeling, you know, of butterflies in my stomach. Like, and, and I remember this voice screaming in my head, right, that you don't belong, you're not good enough, there's no way you're going to be doing well. And somehow, some way, I ignored the voice, I ignored the butterflies, and kept going. And I also should mention, the competition was televised on ESPN. Sister. Very strong upper bodies in this tango. Great control. And things started out really well. But then you'll notice we made a mistake. Did you see it? It'll actually, there'll be a red circle. My hair thingy fell out. And, unfortunately. And that actually resulted in a mandatory, mandatory deduction, which meant that we wound up being placed a little bit lower. And as the competition proceeded, we just could not recover from that placement. And so we wound up not qualifying for the, the Olympic team. We were still alternates, but that's not the same thing. And, you know, at this time, you know, if you're thinking about spending years working towards this one goal, I mean, the disappointment that you're feeling, that I felt not qualifying. And I really had to kind of step back and think about, well, what's next? What, I'm, what am I going to do? And um, I needed to get well, right? I had the shoulder issue. Um, and I also, you know, needed to recalibrate what was next for me. And it took me about a year um, to recover. I had surgery, and I also was doing all this physical therapy. But interestingly, in that year, I had started um, the aeronautics and astronautics program at University of Washington. And now I had all of this spare time to do extracurricular activities and be involved in uh, projects like running experiments on the Vomit Comet, uh, that was, which is a program that NASA runs. And I, was, I found myself being surrounded by really wonderful mentors, um, people who would nudge me into trying new things, um, trying to engage in different experiences that I never would have thought to do on my own. And um, what became apparent to me, um, thanks to their mentorship, was that the next step for me could be graduate school. And what I learned really quickly, actually what I remembered, was this reawakening of a childhood dream. I feel like a lot of kids out there have this dream of, OK, I want to be an astronaut someday. I mean, me too. But I felt that by pursuing my education, especially in aerospace, I might be able to realize that childhood dream and become an astronaut for NASA. And so that journey then took me to uh, NASA Ames as part of the NASA Academy program. And then on to graduate school at Caltech, um, which also manages and operates the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And um, I remember this voice, right, when I got to graduate school, was saying, you don't belong here, right? And I looked around and I saw very few women that were, were peers or mentors in that location. But I ignored it again. And I learned as much as I could. And I also learned of other worlds and other places besides space that um, has life, right? And um, then I started to realize that, you know, manned exploration of space, there's so few opportunities for that. And then there's these other worlds that could benefit from it as well. And so that's why I have this transition where, where in graduate school, I um, stopped looking for life in outer planets and instead started looking at life much closer to home in our oceans. And what was, I think, really profound to me is that, you know, in space we have yet to find life, but in our oceans it's teeming with life that we know very little about. And so that explains why I am now uh, a principal engineer at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in Moss Landing, California. 
And um, we, uh, including scientists and engineers, work together to develop new technologies so that we can understand our ocean as well as its inhabitants. Mbari is located in Moss Landing for very good reason. Um, if you look at the bathymetry of Monterey Bay, you can see that Moss Landing is at the entrance of a deep submarine canyon. And what that means is we can get, in a very short transit time via a research vessel, to deep waters to do our science or to test our new technology. And Mbari operates two different research vessels. This one in particular is the Western Flyer. And um, each one of our research vessels also has a remotely operated vehicle, a deep diving robot that allows us to access these really difficult to see places like in the deep sea. And as a principal engineer and lead of the Bioinspiration Lab, my team develops tools and uses these platforms in order to study animals in this really difficult uh, to reach place. One of the animals that we study are giant larvations. Giant larvations are these uh, gelatinous animals that secrete these huge mucus structures. And when I say mucus, I really mean mucus, like out of snot. Um, so these mucus houses can be uh, secreted by the animal and they can blow them up like balloons. Um, and these animals can live in these mucus houses that can be up to a meter or two meters across. Uh, what we know is that we can find these animals worldwide, but here in Monterey Bay, they're anywhere from 50 to 400 meters deep. And um, these animals have been shown to be really effective filterers, right? And so as an engineer or bioengineer, what we're trying to do is understand how they build these houses and how they function so that we can understand or develop new technologies like filtration technologies to clean our environment or even remove the ocean's microplastics. So what we've also done is we've developed a laser-based imaging system that allows us to use those vehicles to study what these animals are doing in their environment. And what we do is a lot like an MRI or CT scanner where you can scan through the entire animal, including its mucus house, and develop stacks of images. And you can take those image stacks and then reconstruct them in three dimensions so now you get not only an exterior view of what those mucus structures look like, you can also get an interior view, where each one of those channels have a specific function, and they wind up converging at one point in the animal's mouth. And so we are only just discovering and understanding what these animals are doing amongst a lot of other animals. And the reason why we're doing what we're trying to do is that someday, these studies could potentially inspire technologies that we can't even imagine. But we first have to start understanding what's in our oceans. And for part, so basically, hmm. so right now my focus is on generating knowledge, right? Understanding of the ocean, and particularly doing this in a location that is very difficult to reach, like the ocean midwaters or the ocean twilight zone. And it's for this reason that National Geographic Society has um, added me to their list of explorers, where now I get to be involved in worldwide initiatives to um, change perceptions, change views, and change experiences in how we share our natural world. And I remember the very first time I was invited by National Geographic Society to come and visit their headquarters in Washington, D.C., and as part of that, I was asked to give a talk on my research and to do so in the Grosvenor Auditorium. And if you've heard of the Grosvenor Auditorium, this is the famed auditorium where explorers, many generations of them, would come to headquarters and explain and describe what work they've been up to. And I had this opportunity to finally do that. And you can imagine, I was nervous. And a lot like skating, you know, that butterfly feeling that I had. I mean, it all returned. Uh, I remember that voice screaming, like, why are you here? You can't possibly have anything interesting to say that this audience might care about. And somehow, some way, I was able to quiet that voice. I'm not a marine scientist. Uh, in fact, I started my journey in science as an aerospace engineer. 
And some of you might wonder, uh, did I get lost along the way? <laughs> <laughs> and so looking back over these experiences, um, I have a really hard or difficult time teasing out which one is the most important. Um, in fact, I argue these things have been so intertwined that I just think I'm better for it. And if I had stopped at any one particular point along my journey and listened to this voice that was dictating to me how I should live my life or what things and opportunities I should pursue, I think I would have been disappointed. I think I would have missed out on a lot of experiences that I've loved, and I wouldn't be here sharing with you my journey. And so the next time you hear that voice, and keep in mind, that voice is really a manifestation of your fear of failure. Everyone has it. It's whether or not we listen to it that gives it power. And so that fear of failure is very real. And so just because you're afraid of something doesn't mean you should try it. And if you're not failing from time to time, you're really not pushing the boundaries of your potential. So the next time you hear that voice, either say you don't belong or that you're not good enough, just laugh. Um, take a deep breath and then say, watch me. Thank you. <laughs>